Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Standing Committee on Public Accounts. Today is Thursday, September 21st, 2023. Um, this is our one thirty meeting, and um, we've got a lot, uh, a lot on the agenda. And excited to hear about this topic. And um, uh, just want to welcome uh, members here. Uh, Carla Bernard is here. Um, Tyler DeRoche, um, Sydney McEwing. Um, uh, I forget what. The, the, what do we call what do we call the other members? Observing, observing members. members. Zach Bell is an observing member, and so is Matthew McKay. Welcome. Um, uh, can I get a motion to adopt the agenda? Okay. Uh, Carla Bernard. Um, so today we're uh, we're getting an import, important briefing um, from Darren Noonan, the Auditor General, and uh, we'll, we'll allow the other staff to introduce themselves for Hansard, and then we'll pass the floor over to you. Um, for everybody watching, we're going over the annual report to the Legislative Assembly for 2023. So um, uh, people at home can, can tune in and, and, uh, and understand what the Auditor General has been up to. So uh, we also have Hal Perry uh, here as well today, too. So I'll pass it over for Darren, and then he can, uh, each of the staff members can introduce himself for Hansard, and then uh, proceed with your presentation, and then we can discuss about how it's working. I don't mind clarification questions from the committee, uh, as long as uh, we'll, we'll figure out how, if we want to, break in each section or whatever our guests prefer, just run smoothly and make sure that the public understand and, and hear as much information as possible. However you do. All right, thank you. Um, thank you for having us. Um, and thanks for deferring this from Tuesday to Thursday to give us a couple of days to get moved to the new office. So I uh, appreciate that. Um, with me today, I have um, Sherry Griffin. She's a Assistant Auditor General of Performance Audit. I have Elvis Elisic. He's the Assistant Auditor General of Financial Audit. And Luke Rolich is uh, Director of Financial Audit. Um, I think the agenda has him as Performance Audit, but he's actually financial. Um, so I think there's a correction on our website that we need to, uh, need to make. Um, so we do have our annual report. Uh, just a couple of things before we get started. It's our 2023 annual report, which was tabled in March of 2023. And the information that's contained in this report, um, financial, is related to March 31, 2022. Yep. And the performance audit and uh, follow-up is, I guess it's just follow-up, Treasury Board and follow-up is 2023 work that we did. Or sorry, 2022 work that we did. So the information's a little bit uh, old, but there's still some, some stuff in there that mm -hmm. we still think we should present. Um, so we do have a long presentation. It's about 60 slides, um, and we're going to split it up a little bit. I'm going to do seven of the 12 chapters. Sherry's going to do a couple, and Elvis is going to do uh, the remaining three. So um, we'll get started. I don't know. Certainly we'll answer questions as they come up, um, but I think it's better if we kind of get through the presentation first. Um, but if anyone does have a question throughout the, the presentation, we'll certainly take it and, and address it at that time. Hmm. Okay, so the first chapter is just a little chapter on, on our office. So the Office of the Auditor General is an independent office of the Legislative Assembly. The Audit Act establishes the framework for our office, and our office is required to report to the Legislative Assembly at least once every year. Within our mandate, we are able to select the audits and examinations uh, that we would like to conduct. Our office has the authority to access all records, information, and individuals when conducting our work. And any information requests that we make with respect to our work, um, we expect a responsive and timely manner from our auditees. Our current staff, um, there's myself as the Auditor General, I have three assistant auditors general, one audit principal, four audit directors, four audit managers, 12 auditors, one executive assistant, and a strategic advisory committee. <clears throat> Within uh, our office, we've established um, some performance indicators just to help us assess um, our own work. So, 
one of them is statutory reporting deadlines. So we strive to make sure that we meet the statutory deadlines for any of the um, entities that we do financial audits for. And for the 2021-2022 uh, fiscal year, seven of the 11 financial audits that we completed did meet the deadline. Previous year's recommendations, so we like to assess how the auditees are doing with uh, implementing our recommendations, <clears throat> and we are starting to see an increase uh, in the number of recommendations that are being implemented, so that's a, that's a very positive sign, and I think there's a few reasons behind that, um, which uh, we can probably talk about in the follow-up chapters when we get to those. Um, an increasing reports issued. So originally, our office had planned to issue nine reports in the 2022-2023 uh, fiscal year. Our office issued five reports. And the, the main reason why we didn't get to the nine was um, just the COVID audit, just se seeming to drag on and on and on. So we do have a lot of work in the pipeline. So over the next uh, six to nine months, there will be lots of, lots of reports coming forward. Chapter 2, a small chapter on the Public Accounts Committee. So in 2022-2023, uh, our office met with the Standing Committee on Public Accounts on six different occasions. We reviewed our 2022 annual report, a report on overdue property taxes, um, a report on the follow-up of previous performance audits, a uh, follow-up on the uh, Atlantic Lottery Corporation joint audit done by the Fort Atlantic Province uh, Auditors General. We did a report on forest management and we reviewed a report on performance reporting phase one. Chapter three, Climate Leadership Act. So the Climate Leadership Act became official on April 1, 2019. <clears throat> the objective of, the, of this act is to charge a levy on fuel in an effort to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to meet the target level set out in subsection 7.1 of the Net Zero Carbon Act. <clears throat> the Net Zero Carbon Act came into effect on December 31, 2021, and sets out the updated greenhouse gas emission target levels to achieve carbon neutrality by 2040. And within that act, our office is required to report annually on the levies collected and returned to Islanders. So highlights from, from that, uh, from the act or reporting requirement, $18.5 million was collected as carbon levy revenue in the 2021-2022 fiscal year. $19.8 million was returned to Islanders during that period, uh, <clears throat> which constitutes a net loss to the province of approximately $1.3 million. Amounts collected for the 2022-2023 fiscal year under this act are expected to increase compared to 21-22 uh, as a result of the carbon levy rate increases on fossil fuels that came into effect on May 9th, 2022. Effective July 1 of 2023, collection and reporting under this act will end as the federal government will be imposing a federal carbon tax in Prince Edward Island. The federal carbon tax will be levied on additional types of fuels, such as home heating fuels, which were previously exempt. Chapter four is a brief chapter on the Government Advertising Standards Act. So this, this act establishes standards for government advertisements. Under section 5.1 of the act, a head of government may ask our office to review an advertisement before it is released. Under section 6.1 of the act, a member of the Legislative Assembly may file a complaint with our office about a specific government advertisement after it's been placed. And just to report, there were no requests uh, received by our office between um, March 2nd, 2022, and the release of uh, this report, which would have been March 7th, 2023. Chapter 5, a brief update on COVID-19 work that we're almost completed. Um, on, January, on July 20th, 2023, um, we issued our phase two report. Um, that report included two recommendations to the province and the nature of the findings and recommendations were very consistent with what we found in, in phase one. We do expect to issue phase three report in the coming months. 
uh, and follow up on the recommendations presented in all three phases um, will be followed up approximately 12 months following the date of the phase three report. So that, that would be a little break for me now. I'm going to turn it over to Sherry to go over um, the two follow-up chapters. So chapter six um, is related to the implementation of our 2018, 2019, 2020, and 2021 recommendations. Um, so performance audits and examinations include recommendations to improve government processes and protect the interests of island taxpayers. It's important for, excuse me, for MLAs and islanders to receive regular updates on the progress government is making and implementing our recommendations. We follow up on the implementation of recommendations approximately one year after the initial audit and then for three more years after that. The objective of our follow-up work is to provide limited assurance on those recommendations assessed by management as implemented. The scope included recommendations from our 2018 to 2021 annual reports, excluding financial audits. These four annual reports included 103 recommendations from 11 performance audits and examinations. Um, management provided an assessment of the status of the implementation of each recommendation as at August 31st, 2022. We conduct follow-up work only on those recommendations reported by management as being implemented as of that date. So our implementation rates as of, again, August 31st, 2022 were for 2018 recommendations, 90% were implemented, 2019, 85%. 2020, 86%, and 2021 were 37.5% were implemented. Uh, this chart um, provides a visual of the rates of implementation of recommendations since we began following up based on limited assurance, so back to 2012. And the annual report year refers to the year we initially reported the recommendations. Further action may have been taken on some of the recommendations after we followed, like ceased following up. And this chart is for the 2028 or our 2020 2018, excuse me, <laughs> annual report recommendations. Um, so the summary of the recommendations, like implemented or not implemented, from the 2018 annual report as of August 31st, 2022. So you can see um, social assistance program audit were 82% implemented, medication controls was 93%, and the Office of the Public Guardian was 100% implemented as of that date. If you have a report there, um, referring to some appendices, which we don't have slides for, but just to make notes on Appendix B in our report, which starts on page 38, it shows the complete list of any recommendations for all our audits and the status of implementation as of August 31st as concluded by our office. There's a lot of detail in our follow-up report regarding that. Appendix F in our report, which starts on page 49, shows how management responded to our recommendations um, and the ones that weren't implemented, like that management stated to us were not implemented. We don't conduct any work on the ones that management tells us are not implemented. Um, and we encourage readers to refer to Appendix F as it provided, it provides management's detailed update, as an update on the status of the recommendation that they report is not implemented. It provides a lot of good information on what, how, like how close they are to implementing it. So with our 2018 annual report, this was the third year we followed up on these recommendations, also the final year. The implementation rate went from 290% from 60% the previous year. Okay. Our 2019 annual report, so similar to the previous slide, this chart depicts the number of recommendations implemented and outstanding from our 2019 annual report performance audits and examinations as of August 31st, 2022. We had three audits that year, early learning and child care centers with 79% implemented, capital asset plan for provincial parks, 
and procurement of goods for government departments, 83%. So another appendix, um, Appendix C in our report, starts on page 41. It gives a complete list of all the recommendations for each audit and the status of implementation con as concluded by our office as of August 31st, 2022. Twenty nineteen, this is was the second year we followed up on these recommendations. The implementation rate went to eighty five from seventy one percent the previous year, and we'll do one more year of follow up on these twenty nineteen recommendations. Twenty twenty. Um, so we had three audits that that year. Um, accessibility supports program was ninety two percent implemented. IT security access controls was 50% implemented. Laboratory services, surgical specimen processing, 83% implemented. And another appendix, appendix D on 44, page 44, um, provides a complete list of all the recommendations for each of these audits and the statute, the status of implementation. Okay. So 2020, annual report is the second year we followed up on those. Implementation rate went to 86% from 43% the previous year, and we will do two more years of follow-up on these recommendations. 2021, we had two audits. Um, the International Student Program uh, was 38% implemented, and the Crown Corporation's Governance Survey was 36% implemented as at August 31st, 2022. And this was the first year we assessed implementation of these 2021 recommendations. Um, an average 37.5% were implemented and we will follow up for three more years on these recommendations. Um, so with this, um, the 2021 recommendation, like part of our process was, which changed just a couple years ago, was to start assessing implementation a lot sooner. So now we do um, like one year after. So that's why some of the first year the rates are a little bit lower. It's kind of to be expected at this point. Um, okay, so overall highlights. The implementation rates of recommendations issued in 2018, 2019, and 2020 have significantly improved from last year's follow-up. We've already sent correspondence to the departments and crowns that have reckon recommendations addressed to them between 2019 and 2022, and we are currently completing our follow-up work on those recommendations. We hope to report early in 2024. <coughs> So the next chapter, Chapter 7, is a pretty short chapter. It's follow-up with Treasury Board. So each entity we audit is required to provide quarterly updates to Treasury Board on the implementation of our audit's recommendations, our office's recommendations, excuse me. So we have not examined the content of the quarterly updates provided to Treasury Board and provide no assurance on the content. This chart is a little hard to read. Yeah, it's very hard to read, but um, it's in our annual report. If you want to have a closer look, um, it's easier to see, but it provides um, just the status of whether a quarterly update was provided by each of the auditees for each of the quarters since the requirement came into effect. Um, yeah, I'll skip over that one. I think that I mentioned earlier, um, We've seen an increase in the implementation, and I think this this was a policy that Treasury Board put in place in 2019. Mm -hmm. I think it was a result of a recommendation from this committee, um, which requires them uh, anybody that's been audited by our office has to report to Treasury Board every quarter on how they're coming with um, implementing the recommendations. Mm -hmm. So I think just that reinforcement of having to look at it every quarter um, is helping with um, having more attention paid to them. So I think that policy was, has been very helpful in um, seeing some of our recommendations being implemented. Okay, I'll take over. Um, chapter 
create the introduction of financial audits. So in financial audit section of the annual report, um, it provides observations and recommendations resulting from our annual audit of the consolidated financial statements. We also report in our findings from audits of a number of agencies, trusts, and trust funds at Crown Corps. Um, and we provide a summary of issues reported in our management letters. We also examine the processes for recording current and capital appropriations, as well as the approvals, processing, and recording of special warrants, appropriation transfers, and sequestrations. And we provide summary and information and observations. And finally, we'll provide a summary of financial highlights and comments on indicators of financial condition for the, condition for the province presented as of March 31, 2022. <clears throat> so the following will be discussed in the following slides. Um, introduction to financial audits. Um, our office performs financial audits for 10 entities. Um, they are the province of PEI, Health PEI, Agricultural Insurance Corporation, Public Sector Pension Plan, Crown Building Corporation, PI Lotteries Commission, Self Insurance Risk Management Fund, Teachers Pension Plan, Public Trustee, and the Supreme Court of PI Trust Accounts. Um, Canadian auditing standards require us to um, obtain a high level of assurance to determine whether the financial information is free from material misstatement and we obtain sufficient and appropriate audit evidence to express our opinion. Our audit findings are communicated to the Legislative Assembly as part of annual reports such as this. Um, government's responsibility is for the management and control of um, public resources. Um, uh, the presentation of financial statements and other financial information is one way in which government demonstrates accountability. Management is responsible for the preparation and fair presentation of financial statements with oversight from those charged with governance, which we consider to be, for public accounts, the Treasury Board. Um, the auditor is independent of the financial preparation and reporting process. The work of an independent auditor provides assurance that the financial statements are fairly presented in all material respects. Um, the Audit Act requires our office to perform financial audits of the province's consolidated financial statements, crown controlled or owned corporations, trusts, and funds held by any agency of government insofar as they're not subject to a financial audit by a separate external auditor. So now we're going to get into the Chapter 9 where we kind of get into the results from our consolidated uh, financial statements audit and then um, we'll proceed to other chapters which will present our other fi uh, findings. So I think the key thing to know here is that, I mean, we've communicated these findings to management last year, so this is like a year later um, that we're providing this you know, here, they're presenting these here. I mean, you know, so a year ago, these were communicated to management. Six months ago, they were um, tabled in the Legislative Assembly as part of this annual report. And now um, we're communicating to you guys. So I think it's important to know that, you know, some of these have been already addressed by government as well. Um, some of these findings just kind of based on our latest follow-up. Um, anyways, the consolidated financial statements include the financial results of core government departments, the operating fund, um, without the various crown corporations, funds, and agencies controlled by government. Uh, the Comptroller's Office, they prepare the consolidated financial statements as well as the working papers and other support and documentation, which are then provided to us for audit, and our audit was conducted in accordance with Canadian auditing standards. So some of the highlights from this chapter um, are as follows. We issued an uh, unqualified or clean audit opinion of the province's 2022 financial statements. Um, some of our findings are that improvements to various processes are required. Um, the issues we identified were mostly recurring issues that we noted in the past as well. Um, and we'll discuss them more in the following slides. Um, Treasury Board Policy and Procedure Manual is not up to date. Uh, was another finding. We identified some sections of the Treasury Board uh, Policy and Procedures Manual that, was, that were outdated and not in line with the current legislation. legislation. Uh, Treasury Board Policy and Procedure Manual is an important resource that assists government employees in administration and decision making. It should be up to date. Um, phase two environmental site assessment was still required at the, and is, is still required at the Queens County Highway Depot site. Uh, Department of Transportation noted that they plan to have a such, assessment, such assessment completed but have yet to do so due to the prior use of this site as a COVID-19 testing site. They also noted that the results of the assessments will likely identify areas of concern given the historic use of the depot. Um, as there's potential for contamination in need of remediation, we believe this assessment should be completed in a timely manner. Um, just a quick update on that item. They have engaged somebody to do this assessment, mm -hmm. and they mentioned that they will be completed by the end of November. So, we'll see. Um, a few transactions were not recorded in accordance with public sector accounting standards. Um, items like payable accruals were not set up accurately. Um, and while some of these adjustments were recorded, um, we just feel like, you know, better care should be exercised when preparing you know, um, information for audit. Um, 
we've also identified some areas for improvement in regards to financial statement presentation, which we'll discuss um, in the following slides. Budget presentation needs some improvement. We have some suggestions there, along with a few other items for consideration that we'll discuss in the following slides. Um, so in terms of processes that require improvement, uh, grant funding arrangements was one. Uh, the province provided 105 million of post-secondary grant funding um, in 2022. The most significant ones were 36 million to UPI and 20 million to Holland College for core operational funding. There were no formal agreements in place with UPI or Holland College for this funding. The most recent funding agreement with UPI expired on March 31, 2021, while no funding agreement with Holland College has been in place over the last number of years. In addition, there was no Treasury Board approval obtained for this funding, which is required by TV Policy and Procedures Manual. Um, again, the update on that is that there are, we just we did receive the signed agreement. So again, that's something that has been implemented, which is, which is really good. Um, management of pandemic inventory. We noted a lack of safeguards, a facility that we're storing PP&E, <clears throat> specifically lack of security clearance. Variances were identified between quantities tracked in the system and on hand. As staff were using manual spreadsheet, spreadsheets, the value of pandemic inventory contributed by the feds and initially reported was significantly understated due to incorrect units of measure applied to this inventory. Um, and anyways, we found a few other variances as well. Um, now, for the most part, this pandemic inventory has been um, or is, is being um, written off for the most part. Yeah, sorry, um, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, yeah. Can I just get you to, to uh, it's being recorded, so okay. um, I'll just get you to maybe slow down a touch. Okay, and maybe sorry. I'm just, just trying to get through so I can get to no, the questions. I know, you know I know, but just, you know, just yeah. a fraction just, just, so just, that just people. Just slow down a little bit. Sure, yeah, because sure. what's that? Should we vote on? <laughs> <laughs> just keep going. Sorry about that. Sorry yeah. to interrupt. <laughs> I've seen Howard with a capital budget, and he can whip through that. <laughs> <laughs> what is he doing? Uh, Thanks. Sure. Uh, social program overpayments. Um, there were uncollected overpayments of 8.3 million, of which one, of which about 2 million has occurred in the last uh, few years alone. Um, majority of this balance relates to adjustments, errors, and misrepresentations associated with client income levels and living arrangements. Um, there's timely collection of federal receivables. Significant amount of age receivables from Government of Canada are outstanding for longer for, for more than a year. Our claims are not being submitted to the feds on a timely basis. And correspondence with Canada Revenue Agency, um, using detailed breakdown of corporate income tax filers would enable the province to more accurately project this income, uh, corporate income tax revenue um, than the current model that's being used, which kind of uses more general data. Um, so anyways, that was another recommendation that was made. Um, financial statement presentation. Uh, the main item, um, so the consolidated financial statements contain a number of note disclosures and schedules which are an integral part of the consolidated financial statements that they're used to provide information to clarify and explain items in the consolidated financial statements. The following area was identified as requiring improvement. Um, contractual obligations, <clears throat> disclosures provide information to users about government resources that have been committed for future spending and contractual rights provide information to users about future resources that will be available to meet obligations or finance uh, operations. Consistent with prior years, we noted incomplete information and errors in the schedules of contractual obligations provided for audit of approximately $28 million and for contractual rights of approximately $155 million. Budget presentation. Um, Consistent with prior periods, the capital budget of the province does not include expected capital spending by government business enterprises. Government business enterprises are organizations that have the power to contract in their own name and carry on a business by selling goods and services to individuals outside of the government reporting entity, enabling them to meet their liabilities and maintain operations without government support. So, you know, like Liquor Commission, Lotteries Corporation, Shelton Area Development Corporation, um, IWMC, entities like that. So the province does not include any capital estimates for government business enterprises, which incurred capital costs of 30.6 million during the 21-22 fiscal period. More detail for the capital spending would enhance accountability and transparency of the budget. It would also allow members of the Legislative Assembly and the public to assess and debate the budgets of these entities. Um, the, the next few items are just more items for consideration. They're not issues or, or any sort of um, items that, that, you know, have to be corrected. There are more items that are, you know, um, that were reported for, for, for government's consideration. Um, internal audit function was one. 
Uh, PI is the only jurisdiction with no internal audit function. Internal audit function will support province's operations by assessing the reliability of information produced and used by the province, compliance with legislation, policies, and accounting standards, and effectiveness of programs, internal control operations, and exposure to fraud. Um, other item is the New Brunswick and Nova Scotia uh, disclose supplementary information in their public accounts, such as salaries, travel expenses, supplier payments, et cetera, that are over a minimum threshold. Um, and then the last one is just in regards to disclosure around contaminated sites um, and suggestion for the province to, to improve the current disclosure that's, that's, that's on hand, that, that's included within the public accounts. As to retirement obligations, so that's another one, um, that's a big one that we're dealing with this year. It's a brand new standard and it's quite comprehensive. It's, it's, it's very time consuming and it's something that we brought up to the province's attention, the controller's attention really over the last number of years. Um, and, um, you know, we've commented on the importance of getting prepared for this standard early through our previous management letters and annual reports. The province was late in getting ready for this new standard, which has caused various crown corporations to miss their statutory deadlines um, in terms of reporting. And we have some concerns around public accounts this year as well, um, as we're kind of working on that right now. Chapter 10. So this chapter provides summary comments on significant issues noted in the management letters arising from our other financial statement. So the previous one was on the consolidated financial statements. This is on the, on the other Crown Corporation audits that we've completed. Um, we issued management letters for all financial statement audits that we conducted. Our findings are broken down into the following categories, accounting concerns, compliance issues, and internal control weaknesses. Um, a common compliance issue identified was the late filing of annual reports by provincial entities, so we reported on this issue in a separate section of this chapter, and more detail will be provided in the following slides. Um, in terms of accounting concerns, majority related to completeness and accuracy of information provided for audit. Some of the more significant examples are um, a settlement has yet to be reached regarding the disputed academic funding premiums totaling $16.3 million in unpaid billings by health that are owed by Health PI to the province of Nova Scotia. Uh, the balance continues to grow annually by approximately $2 million. Uh, so a settlement should be reached. If the settlement is reached at a different amount than currently recorded, it could have significant impact on the future results of Health PI as any difference between what's currently recorded and what the settled amount will be recognized in the air of of settlement. Um, several pandemic inventory items of health PI were overstated and not recorded at the lower moving average and replacement cost, which is their policy. Uh, the value of pandemic inventory was reduced by 2.9 million, half of its initial value, following our inquiry into this item, given the drop in the market value of replacement cost of PP inventory since when it was purchased, the market value was so high, given there was such high demand. A few years later, not as much demand, the value drops, and it's something that um, eventually could get written down. Many accounting adjustments, totaling 1.5 million, were required to complete the public trustee audit due to inaccuracy identified in the and information provided for audit and the client's application of accounting policies. And we continue to identify issues related to the calculation of the aggregate stability accrual for the PEI Agricultural Insurance Corporation, resulting in a $280,000 adjustment. Compliance issues noted. So the majority of compliance issues that we identified were related to compliance with legislation or Treasury Board policies. Some of the more significant examples were business and strategic plans that health PEI were not submitted, like they were supposed to be submitted prior to the start of a fiscal year. In, in for 2022 fiscal year, they were actually submitted after the completion of the fiscal year, um, the business plan was. Um, and the strategic plan was sort of in, in the middle of the 21-22 fiscal year, it was in October that it was um, approved. Uh, there were grant funding arrangements between PI Lotteries Commission and the harness racing industry, which are for about $4 million. They did not have any signed agreements in place or Treasury Board approval, which is required for such agreements. And unclaimed trust balances held by the public trustee for any clients who had deceased um, over more than five years ago uh, were not paid out uh, to the province in accordance with their act. There were 44 such trust balances which totaled $480,000. <clears> Internal control weaknesses. 
The majority of internal control weaknesses related to the lack of timely resolution and collection of receivables, rebates, and potential recoveries, along with insufficient investment strategies for excess funds. Some of the more significant examples include the following. Um, there's lack of timely billings related to drug product rebates um, at Health PI that have resulted in the slower collection of funds owed to Health PI. Health PI is about a year behind in billing these suppliers. Um, there are potential, sorry, potential physician overpayments that were identified in the prior year that have yet to be internally audited by Health PI. The audit has been delayed due to a vacant physician claims auditor position. Uh, timely completion of this audit is required to make sure that any potential recoveries can be made. Via Housing Corporation is required to submit audited financial, audited financial reports to the Canadian Mortgage Housing Corporation to receive funding in a timely manner. At March 31, 22, um, the corporation was behind the submission of these reports, resulting in approximately $12.3 million withheld by CMHC related to old years, which means that these receivables have been, yeah, outstanding for longer than a year. Um, the PI Crown Building Corporation has been inactive. We know financial transactions since 2012. Operating an inactive company creates an unnecessary administrative burden. If there are no plans to utilize this corporation, we suggested that it gets wound up with the assets transferred to the province. At year end, the bank account of the PI Agricultural Insurance Corporation held significant excess funds in the amount of $39 million. These funds were not invested during fiscal year 2022, resulting in a potential lost income to the corporation. The Supreme Court of PEI lacks internal policies on how to maximize earnings from funds, from funds held, of which, which are about $2.5 million, and there's no guidelines that have been established to specify the intended use of the growing accumulated surplus funds, which have also grown to $275,000. Annual reporting. So a common compliance issue identified was the late filing of annual reports by provincial entities. Annual reports serve as accountability documents to permit stakeholders to assess the performance of departments and reporting entities and the results achieved for money spent. The Financial Administration Act requires that annual reports of reporting entities must be made public within six months of the financial year end. 22 of the 25 reporting entities did not meet their most recent annual reporting deadline. As of January 31, 2023, five reporting entities had yet to publish an annual report for their most recent fiscal year. Government departments are not reporting entities as defined in the Financial Administration Act. However, they are subject to Treasury Board policies that have similar reporting requirements. As of January 31, 2023, only one government department pub published an annual report for the March 31, 2022 period. Timely reporting has been an issue for the past number of years. For example, the Department of Health and Wellness has not issued an annual report since 2015 and the Department of Fisheries and Communities and Social Development and Housing have not issued an annual report since 2020. Um, external audits. So for these are some of the findings that have been uh, noted by the external auditors of other provincial entities. Um, one issue that, that we felt was worth worthy of communication was that um, in regards to their audit of, in regards to the audit of PI Liquor Con uh, Control Commission and PI Cannabis Management Corporation, there were no signed employment contracts in place for casual employees of the commission and the corporation. Okay. Two chapters left to go. <coughs> We're moving along pretty, pretty quickly here. Um, chapter 11 is a chapter on appropriations and special warrants. So the government's annual spending authority <clears throat> is approved by members of the Legislative Assembly through an appropriation act the authority to exceed spending is provided by a special warrant. Special warrants totaling $163.3 million were issued for the year ended March 31, 2022, which was significantly higher than in previous years. The Audit Act requires the Auditor General to list the details and purpose of appropriations made by special warrant. Special warrants were partially offset by $31 million uh, in additional revenue. Some highlights, the Financial Administration Act prohibits expenditures from being incurred unless provided for by an appropriation. Special warrants were not always authorized prior to the expenditures being incurred. <clears throat> Approximately $40 million in late special warrants were issued between June 2022 and January 2023. And two additional late warrants were issued in February of 2023 
nearly a full year after the 2022 fiscal year ended. Chapter 12, our last chapter, it's just where we highlight a few um, financial indicators for the, for the health of the province's finances. So financial highlights for 2021-2022, the province had a surplus of $83.8 million. Um, the original budget was a deficit of $112.1 million. So there's a difference of almost $200 million between actual and, and budgeted results. Revenue was $288.1 million higher uh, than the previous year and $260.8 million higher than budget. Expenses were $198.7 million higher than the previous year and $64.9 million higher than budget. Net debt uh, increased $9.5 million during the year to reach $2.3 billion, which is the highest net debt uh, the province has ever uh, been at. Uh, capital spending increased by $16.7 million uh, compared to the previous year. However, it was $33.1 million lower than what had been budgeted. So some of the financial indicators um, that governments use to, to kind of assess their financial health is sus sorry, sustainability, is the ability to maintain existing programs and services. Flexibility is the ability to increase financial resources as required. And vulnerability is reliance on source of funding outside of the province's control, for example, federal revenues. And the uh, financial indicator ratios for 2022 um, were better uh, than they had been in the previous years. And that's a result of the province's economy is, is performing very well. Some other financial indicators, the net debt to GDP <coughs> decreased in 2022 to its lowest point in the past five years, which is good. Net debt per capita decreased $429 per island resident compared to prior years. Again, that's a positive sign. And net debt to total revenue is declining. However, an increase in total revenues is a big reason um, that that ratio is, is improving. Expenses to GDP have decreased for the first time since 2018, which, and that just means that the economy is growing faster than the increase uh, in government spending. Federal revenues to total revenues have decreased for the first time since 2018, so that comes back to the point about relying on federal revenue. Um, that's a, so that is a positive sign to see that that's kind of gone the other way this, in 2022. Um, the positive indicators were due to the growth in the economy and population. Um, so the growth in the economy and population was, was faster than the growth in government spending uh, in, the, in the fiscal year. Interest charges totaled $121 million during 2021-2022. With net debt at its highest level and the recent rise of interest rates, interest charges have the potential to require a larger amount of future revenues which would reduce available funds for government programs and services. And that's, that's it. Great. Thank you very much for all the presenters. Um, we'll open it up for questions. And this is the first real time the committee has gotten together in public account, so it's kind of maybe if there's some, well, new people, and just take your time and, and uh, ask questions and any good questions. There's, there's all good questions in here, so. Um, don't hesitate because that's a lot of information. So um, we we'll, we have Sydney on the list so far, and just uh, signal to me if you'd like to ask a question. Sydney, thank you, Chair, and thank you all for coming back in and your work as well. I know it's been a lot of extra work, certainly with the COVID uh, uh, reports that you've had to do on top of everything else. Um, one thing that I was uh, curious to know the 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 update or the review on was the report from 2021. Uh, with respect to the PEI International Student Program. I know we had uh, concerns back then when we went through it originally. There were significant issues found, and in, in this, I think, was the part that you were presenting on, Sherry. And, uh, and uh, uh, I'm really, really pleased 
the recommendations that I feel were some of the most important ones uh, were were followed up on. Um, uh, where are they here? 4.43, like the uh, the improved processes involving the, the education agents, uh, the developing and planning of standardized contractual agreements, uh, pretty important, the performing the due diligence procedures, and then, of course, the entering into an agreement with the third party uh, to manage all aspects of the home stay accommodations for the program. We felt that was significant at, at the time, too. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased that those ones were, were followed up on. Um, my question, I guess, is, is uh, you, uh, I, I guess, is, is about the, uh, the, the, why the disagreement? I, I noted that you had said you, uh, the government thought they had completed 10 of the recommendations, and you feel that they've completed five of the recommendations. Where's the disagreement there? So, so the way the, our follow-up process works is we'll contact the department and, or the entity that we audited and ask them um, how they're coming along with their recommendations. And they'll give us their assessment, like they might feel that they have implemented um, uh, the, our recommendation. So if they say they haven't, we don't even look at that recommendation for work. But if they tell us that they did, then we'll go in and we'll, we'll do some samples um, to see that, in fact, that they did make the changes that they said they did. And in, in this case, we noted some that they've been making some progress, but they hadn't, they hadn't completed them. Sydney? Thank you, Chair. So, like in the uh, in the management response at, at the end in the appendix, um, the government indicates that uh, they had taken actions on three recommendations, um, but there's no response uh, indicated for one, two, three, four, five more. Uh, 429, 430, 436, 462, 463. Was there any updates on those ones? Updates in terms of um, their level? On recommendations not yet implemented. Or that ones where you just said you just don't, if they say they're not done, you just don't go in and... and if they say they're them. not done, then we don't do anything with it. Now, 2021, um, that was the first year we looked at them. So we're currently looking at them right now. And we'll continue for this year and one more year. No, this year and two more years. So I, I would expect that some of these recommendations will have been implemented since since this report was done. Well, and they could be now, right? Could be. It's been yeah. months. Yeah. Sydney? Uh, thank you, Chair. So any major concerns, though, with the uh, the, the ones that uh, you and, and the department disagreed on being completed, was there anything that, that you flagged that they pushed back on and said, no, we really feel this is done, and you said no, no, we really feel it doesn't, or was just kind of on the, the progress of it, like they thought they were working on it, so that was good enough? Was yeah, I might let Sherry kind of confirm this, but it, I don't believe there was much pushback on our work after we went in to, to look and then sit down and explain to them why uh, we didn't feel they were implemented. So, um, yeah, I don't think there's any pushback. No, most of them, I believe it had to do with the policies that were in draft and not yet okay. finalized and, and formally approved. And just from a quick look, I think that okay. was most of the, the ones that they had said were implemented, but when we got in, they were still drafts. Yeah, and, that's understandable. Yeah. Yeah. So good right now. Okay. Uh, Carla? Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm going to be kind of all over the place here. Uh, so I'm curious about the, the special warrants. I know that the trend is going in the wrong direction in terms of, uh, of how much we use those. And like $163 million, which was twice as much as the, the previous fiscal year. Um, and I'm wondering about that. So, so looking through the report, there were eight expenses that were incurred before the special warrant was received. And I'm wondering what sort of explanation you got for that. Well, we don't really get into questioning why they were incurred before the special warrant. We really we just go to the executive council approval for the special warrant just to confirm that it was approved. Um, but it's been a recurring problem. Um, last or the 2022 fiscal year seemed to be extremely high 
uh, compared to previous years. And I know it gets discussed here from time to time, and I know when the finance department gets called into committee, um, some of it is related to just accounting adjustments, but some of it is related to just not following the process. Carla? Thank you, Chair. And so I, I, I don't know what the process is, so, so this might not be, this might be a silly question, but so they go in for the money. So where does that, how do they get their hands on that money without the approval? Like, how does that happen? It, it just comes out of the, the province's money that they have on hand, and then the warrant gets approved at a, at a later time. Carla? Sometimes, oh, sometimes the warrants are done uh, in advance. It's not, it's not always not followed properly, but there's a number of situations where it's not followed. Carla? Thank you, Chair. So there's just, there's not normally like one person solely responsible for for doing that. It's kind of... Yeah, so basically what, what should happen is if, if a department, um, so they've, the budget has been tabled in the Legislative Assembly, it's been approved. During the year they determine, you know what, there's a new initiative we're going to roll out. Um, then at that time they should make a submission to Treasury Board to request a special warrant because that's money that wasn't approved in the Appropriation Act. And once they get that approval from Treasury Board, then they would have authorization to incur those expenses. But that process doesn't necessarily always follow that those steps. Carla? Thank you, Chair. That is really shocking to me when we're talking about this amount of money. I just, I don't understand how that just happens. Um, so. One of the other things that, that I noticed in the report that was mentioned, that the, there was no formal contracts with Holland College and UPEI for more than $100 million worth of money going to them. Um, they didn't have Treasury Board approval or contracts. Um, so, you know, in your opinion, had we had those contracts in place, would a, would a um, special warrant have been avoided? Like, are there cases where that's happening, where there's no, we're missing important pieces to our funding agreements, and as a result, we're having to go back and get special warrants? So I, I don't believe there are special warrants required for, for those grants. They were included in the Appropriation Act. Okay. But, again, any, any grant that gets provided, there should be Treasury Board approval uh, over, over the threshold, which was $100,000 at the time, and there should be uh, funding agreements in place. <clears throat> now, Elvis did mention that uh, this summer um, we did see Treasury Board approval and funding, and I got copies of the funding agreements for UPI and Holland College for, of course the, you did. for the current <laughs> fiscal year. So I can confirm that uh, that has taken place and they are working on a multi year um, funding agreement. So um, hopefully we'll see that in the, in the near future. I think there were some valuable lessons learned by government in that, in the last little bit. Thank you. Thank you. Brenda? Uh, Tyler? Uh, <clears throat> pardon me. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I can just imagine the amount of work that you had to put into this. It was a lot to try to absorb. Uh, I imagine it was tireless. So thank you for that. Uh, in a perfect world, your recommendations, we'd see them 100% implemented. And uh, just going through some of it, some of the numbers of implementation and not implement it and all that were a little shocking to m myself. Uh, and then, like, especially like the 2021 with 37.5% implemented, and then you said that's normal because it's the first year, so that was, that relieved a lot. Uh, one question I did have on it when I was going through the slides on the report that you gave, there were some of the recommendations that were not applicable anymore. Are they considered as percent of what's not uh, implemented, or is that just taken right out? Mm -hmm. They get taken right out okay. of the percentage. Yep. Thank you. And Tom, just on the, the 37.5, like um, Sherry did mention that we've changed our follow-up process. Before, um, we used to not look at the work until three years after the original audit, <clears throat> and I felt that that was too long to wait. Um, so we started to go in the following year to see how they're, how they're doing and just to make sure they haven't forgotten about our recommendations. So um, I think in time we're going to see 
those recommendations. The first year, obviously, by the time they even get them from us, sometimes the year is almost over. Um, so we understand that that first year there may not be much done, but you know what we've seen in the second, third, and fourth years um, in this report is a positive sign for for our office. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, that's great. It's uh, the one thing that I did notice that I was pleased to see is when I pulled up the slide with the quarterly reports, how many of them were passed in and all that. Like it's, uh, I believe the work you're doing and implementing all this is only going to make things better. And it's great to see all the departments getting on and making sure the quarterly reports are into you. And so, it's great. Okay. So just to clarify, Tyler, so they they um, submit those reports to Treasury Board. Yes. Um, and Treasury Board does provide us with copies of them, but that reporting is from the department to Treasury Board. So probably not, sorry. Oh, Tyler, so, sorry, go you. ahead. I'm so probably not quite as detailed as <coughs> you would be liking, but it still lets you well, know. Well, at least it's top of mind for them. Good. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Uh, Carla? Thank you, um, Okay, so... I, first of all, the, um, the Climate Leadership Act, I know that the, the, um, the amount that went back to Islanders exceeded, far exceeded what we had taken in. Um, and so I'm wondering how, how we paid for that. Again, it's just like a special warrant. It would just come out of the government funds. And when you have a year with a surplus, obviously there's going to be additional funds around. So... Thank you. So in a situation like that where, you know, we we know the revenue approximately or, or directly what we're going to be taking in, government has an initiative like that, like would it be your hope that in a case like that where, you know, we're given a bit of time and that is it, I don't even know what my question is, but how, like, shouldn't government know that and shouldn't like I don't I don't understand how we're going for special warrants when it's things that we've said that or not we the government has said they're going to do yet they still have to go to special warrants so I guess that kind of leads back to what you were saying earlier like is it accounting issues that they're but not budgeting properly or forecasting properly uh, well in in this situation that you know there were a number of initiatives that they that they spent the money on. Um, if, if the money was coming in one hand and that same hand was, was putting it out, it's a lot easier to keep track of. But when you've got six or seven initiatives that are going on through various departments and the money's flowing in to the finance department, sometimes it's hard to kind of keep a pulse on everything that's going on. I know the first year that we did our work, um, they did, they did recognize that at a certain point that they were going to overspend, and they stopped. Um, that was when they were giving free licenses, I believe, driver's licenses. So they, they did recognize it. It was a little bit too late. They still had overspent, but they did. They were keeping track of it. So it's just a matter of the number of initiatives that are, that are being put on at the time. Carol. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm going to jump now to... to um, the environmental assessments, that's something that was that has been on my mind, given it's in my district oh, yeah. and I hear about it a lot. Um, and, and you know, we heard at, uh, recently, and from your presentation as well, that this is something that, they, that has been finally embarked on. Um, but I mean, that goes to show, I mean, this is a project that is the plan, that is the long-term plan, yet we have no idea how much this environmental assessment Look, how much it's going to cost us if there is remediation that needs to be done. Um, so, you know, I just, something as simple as an environmental assessment is just so irresponsible to me that we didn't do that because it is our long-term plan. Um, so, with the environmental assessments, do you, in, the, how, when was the first time that that, that was identified as an issue? I believe it was March 31, 2021. Like yeah. yeah, we, we, go ahead, Luke. Uh, 
uh, March 31, 2021 audit. Um, we, we get questionnaires from the departments where we ask um, a lot of different generic questions to kind of obtain information to do our audit planning. And this was one item that was noted um, by the department that they were kind of planning to do this and they expected that they were probably going to find, uh, find some issues there. So that was kind of the first time that it came to our attention. And then we yeah, included that in a management letter and in a report that year. So about a few years ago, I guess. So, and in our uh, 2022 annual report, if you know, if you go back to refer, our recommendation said that this assessment should be done in a timely manner. And in this year's recommendation, you'll notice we put in a, a deadline for them. So that we felt it should be done, should have been done already. So it's good that uh, it has been, I, I think they took core samples in, in September. Um, so that should be done by the end of November, but I'm not sure if it took us saying it needs to be done by the state, but it should have been done. Yeah, that's a lot of potential. Well, it is a lot of money, but if this remediation costs a lot, this is taxpayers who are footing that bill. Like, anyway, I need to process that before I ask any more questions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, <clears throat> I just have uh, well a few questions here. Um, um, what's the reason uh, for the delay in the Housing Corp submitting its audited financial report to CMHC? You know, it's resulted in twelve million dollars in funding being withheld. Uh, Mike Elf, this has been an ongoing battle with that department um, even before I kind of took this role. It's just been. Um, They've had years of arrear financial statement audits to be completed, and um, it's it's really been catch up for a long time, hasn't it, Elvis? Yeah. <clears throat> so, in terms of housing, I think it's mostly that they're short staffed. Is what we've been told is the reason why things are um, behind. Having said that, I think Luke, maybe you can kind of chime in on kind of the latest update on on where that funding is um, that that was outstanding. For those outstanding receivables. Yes. Yeah, so I think we mentioned there was about 12 million there that was outstanding over a year. And uh, when we recently checked in on that, about 10 million of that has been received since then. Um, but yeah, I know it was mentioned that short staffing impacts that. There's also, um, as Darren said, there's, there's some audits to be done too on the financial information that they submit to CMHC to get that funding. So, um, you know, getting those, there could be delays in getting that prepared and then they do have to send that off and get it audited, so there could, there, there's basically lots of different kind of ways along where there could be delays and things can kind of get mm -hmm. held up, but it's probably a, a series of multi-issues that, that contribute mm -hmm. to that, but. Um, and and just, to, just, just to add another point, um, is that um, the audits that we're talking about here are not necessarily financial audits, like the financial statements, they're just, they're just will be um, audits of those, um, the spending for that program specific program that they're looking to get funding for. So they're not just like overall housing, PI housing statement um, audits, but specific program audits for that that's, that's uh, associated with that funding. Do you think as auditors and, and looking back at the past, if we're talking about a department that is, is you, saying that they're short staffed, how long has that short staffed argument been going? And do you think it's acceptable being in a housing crisis and not having the staff right now to build into the future when we when we're looking at receivables from the past. That's yeah. Not Scott it's just quite a mm -hmm. it's not Scott. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No. No. The, you know, it's it's a bit of an issue. You, you need to have the people there to to do proper planning and and growth. So I acknowledge that. But you know, it's not only that department. It's throughout government. Um, there's a there's a lot of stress on good financial people uh, in the private industry as well. It's it's hard to get people. Um, it's not much different than the doctor and nurse situation. People know they need them, but you, you can put advertisements out. Even our office sees it, and you don't get any good quality applicants. Mm -hmm. It's 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 difficult. Mm -hmm. no. In your mind, is it something this committee should follow up on, or should we? 
push a little more, or since this time of this report's come out, have you been in contact with this? And you find that, I think you said 10 million of it's been received. Um, is this where we need to be right now? I think some questions that the, that the committee could ask government is, <clears throat> do they have enough financial people in place? I, I feel that when we when we meet with some of the financial directors and, and managers that they they feel stressed and overwhelmed by time. So, mm -hmm. you know, that would lead me to believe that perhaps there's a little bit too much on their plate mm -hmm. and maybe some assessments do need to be made of, of staffing levels within the finance area. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, just moving to 947. Um, it's the capital budget, and that's $30.6 million. Uh, consistent with prior periods, the capital budget of the province does not include expected capital spending by government business enterprises. So that's $30.6 million that, that we don't see, or we did not see in the Legislative Assembly um, before it got approved. Um, d d would that be... Should that be in, how do we see that? How do we end up seeing that? Is it in the next year? Is there, is there an asterisk in the next year? Or, or uh, well, so the government business enterprises, it's an area that we've, we've had recommendations on the budgeting aspect of that for quite some time. Even on their revenue and expenses, um, in prior years, you would just get one number yeah. in the budget. Now you get two numbers. You get revenue and expenses. I'd still like to see more detail than that, but you get that. But on the capital side of it, there's nothing that, that the members get to see. And I made a reference to, to Hal. I, I watch the capital budget when, when the House is going through, and there's a lot of questions on the capital expenditures. So there's $30 million that um, the members don't get a chance to, to ask any questions about. And for the public, can you just give us some examples of what that $30 million would be? And if that, um, I know it's probably in here, but I've got like six pages open. Um, it's probably not specified in there. So I don't have the specifics on what the items were, but CADC spent 16.3 million. Uh, IIDI spent 3.5 million. Island Waste Management Corporation were 1.4 million. PEI Energy Corp was 8.6 million. And PEI Liquor and PEI Cannabis were just about 750,000. So I don't know what the specific spends were. We could probably get the details. Would that be something the committee would look into uh, in public accounts? I mean, I don't know, like $750,000 for PEI liquor. I'd like to see what, what that was for. It seems like a round number. It's, I mean, the, the number's in here, but it, it's not in the Legislative Assembly, which, you know, it kind of it doesn't really make, make much sense. So this was in the past. Do you, is that number been consistent over time, or... Um, is that is that high 30 30 point six million um, did we look at that Elvis um, in terms of the number the 30.6 million I, I don't know for sure that it's higher or lower than others like I, I'd say it's probably probably close with, to, to what normal is maybe maybe slightly higher I, I can't say for sure I guess without looking at it just thinking about the past I don't know that it was too different um, and just to kind of clarify too, like if say liquor commission was to um, proceed with a capital project, they still have to follow the treasury board policy in terms of um, in terms of uh, entering a contract over. Say say this project was going to be for five ten million. Um, if the contract is over two hundred and fifty, what's the threshold now? Two hundred fifty. Two fifty now. Two hundred fifty thousand. Then they still have to go through treasury board for approval of that contract. Um, and then have to say kind of where the, where the funding is coming from, but but yes, this this these expenditures, um, these capital expenditures are not, yeah, included anywhere in the budget. And the main reason is just because of the way that the accounting is for these entities. Their bottom line just kind of flows through to um, 
to, to, to the provinces um, on, to the provinces books and that level of detail is just not included um, it's just kind of included supplementary information but it's not really part of the provinces um, individual sort of line items and statements but but anyways, we do think that it should be something that's included in, in the, even, even the supplementary information well, yeah yeah just so you, just so the, the, the legislative assembly is aware of it yeah because we get that for we get that for um, uh, expenses that Carla was talking about that's really right. drawing a blank right now but yeah well, and another example is health PEI. Like you do get that detail mm. for health PEI. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And yeah, we'll talk about it later. Um, okay. Yeah. Thanks for that. I'm just touching on a, on a few different areas to make sure that we're we're, we're covering um, things accordingly. Um, Ten point nine uh, health PEI's uh, liabilities include sixteen point three million dollars owing to the province of Nova Scotia for unpaid billings related to the academic funding premiums. Um, and you say that's that's rising by two million dollars per year, and that that PEI should, um, in there, I think it should, uh, it could affect uh, significant impacts on future operating results of health PEI. Um, that's pretty substantial. What what is that for 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 myself and for people watching? How did that number get so high, and why is it going up by two million dollars a year? Cool. All right. So I guess just to explain kind of what that is. Um, basically, Nova Scotia has teaching hospitals that have academic departments within them, and they have physicians that work in those departments. And I guess I'm not sure of the frequency, but on occasion, those physicians will provide services to Prince Edward Island residents. Um, uh, I guess like physician type um, uh, work. So what Nova Scotia does is they keep track of those services that have been provided and to recover some of the compensation that they're paying those physicians, they turn around and bill that back to PEI. And I guess what happened initially, um, a lot of the individuals that were involved in, in the decision at the time are no longer in those positions, but the feeling was that um, these services should be already covered under other avenues of funding that are already occurring with uh, PEI in Nova Scotia. So the thought at, from PEI at the time was that, you know, in a way we're kind of already covering these off. We don't really agree that we should be separately billed for them. And then since they stopped um, kind of paying those bills, they've just grown about $2 million a year because that would be the, the level of services each year that are accrued there. So in 2014, there was a ministerial directive to stop paying those bills, but the province has one position, but Nova Scotia continues to bill the province. So obviously they have a different uh, position on it. So it's, we just recommend that they sit down and hash it out. And if the province um, doesn't need to be accruing that liability anymore, then it would be a it'd be a positive thing for health PEI. They, that would be kind of a windfall for them if, if that liability goes away. But they should come to an agreement on, yeah. if, is this to continue or not to continue? Mm -hmm. That's that's very, very interesting, because I, I would assume that, because we pay, well, the province pays for seats at Dalhousie, so we'd be talking about the, the residents that are going to, to school there um, as, it, but we also do that with Memorial, and now we're into a partnership with Memorial. So it is a, uh, um, it seems like something that definitely needs to be, needs to be looked at. So it's something maybe we'll, we'll, uh, if we do ever have health PEI in, or would it be? It's, it's, it's just that cost comes down. They, they, they settle a, a agreement. Health PEI is the, is the payee from our side. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, uh, so this would be my last question if the committee wants to ask any other questions too, um, after that. Um, so the, the well, I have two actually. Um, uh, the Department of Health and Wellness, you said, we've talked about this before in this committee with, with no annual reports. The Department of Health and Wellness um, hasn't reported since 2015. Is that current up to today that they have not, that they still haven't had any reports? That would have been up until January of 2023. I don't know. I I don't know. We we haven't done that part of our work for this year yet. Yeah. 
wonder what the date was on that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I can, well, I can get back to you to see if, if we can yeah. see if uh, one has been. Yeah, published. and and please, and you know, this is this is important. That's an important. That's probably one of the, the most important departments. So, 2015. I understand that's going back, and I, the, the argument that I've heard too is that it, we have to spend so much time on the 2015, 16, 17, 18 reports, and we need we need to start. I don't know where the point is where we start fresh. Um, as a committee, uh, what do we push for? If we push for 2015 uh, with a short staff department, I mean. Where is a sensible meet you in the middle? Um, we didn't do it, and this is this is this is liberal and conservative governments uh, d didn't didn't do this. So there's nothing there, but we need this information um, for what would be a recommendation uh, f that we can start to have a discussion with about reaching back into the Department of Health and Wellness and asking for something sensible. That's, I could give you a recommendation, but I think that's a decision that needs to be discussed on the House, on the floor of the House, and okay. elected officials make those decisions. Okay. Great, great, perfect, good answer. <laughs> <laughs> and then when you ask, when you ask <laughs> auditors uh, some, some gray area questions, they always have good answers. Um, maybe another one of those questions, too, would be um, just to get your input, maybe. Um, we, we're going to be talking, too, about whether the funding agreements, um, Department of, of Workforce and Advanced Learning and Population uh, for UPEI, um, if we want to bring people in to talk about that or, um, or I get a written correspondence here from the committee. How big an issue are those documents? Uh, just because we're going to be talking about that soon, I just want to get your opinion on that so we, it, would, it would help us uh, uh, fuel our discussion. What, how big are those documents? Like, there, I've I've seen both agreements. They're they're not that lengthy, and there are some conditions attached to them. Um, and it, it, you know, they do give the province um, the ability to come in and see how that money spent. So I, I felt like what I did see was good, um, but I, I'm not sure what you mean in terms of. Mm -hmm. It's, I would recommend calling them in because they're in the process of drafting a long-term funding agreement. So it would be nice to, if you guys did look at the funding agreements and felt there were some uh, areas that weren't covered properly, you could at least make your point that it should be covered in the, in the long term. Okay. Yeah. That's, an, that's another <laughs> tough question. <laughs> um, no, thank you for answering my questions. And uh, Carla? I'm kind of stuck on the contaminated sites thing because there's a few different areas that pop into my head when, when I think of that. Um, and there's no movement on changes being made to those locations. Are they just going to allow to sit there and rot um, when they're, you know, they're valuable land in both terms of financial and the space, like for housing or whatever, if we were allowed to build on that. But you had mentioned earlier about... Um, I can't remember exactly what you said, but that PEI didn't quite have the same policies or, or information that they give out regarding contaminated sites as they do in other provinces. I'm wondering if you could speak to that a little bit in terms of both what information do they perhaps make public that we don't, or, um, or and I should say, is there anything that you would like to see put in to how we deal with um, things around contaminated sites? So I might defer that to Elvis or Luke in terms of what Nova Scotia and New Brunswick include. But, but basically, Carl, in, in a nutshell, is they just provide more detail, more description of, of where the contaminated site might be, what type of remedial work might be required. Um, whereas the province really here just has a, a couple of lines on the liability, essentially. Yeah, yeah I guess the kind of the main point around that issue it was uh, more focused on like the financial statement disclosure, not necessarily, um, I guess, like in general, like public communications about um, contaminated sites or potential sites. This was um, more of, I guess, a comparison of financial statement disclosure compared to what some of the other provinces do. And uh, like Darren said, 
it would just they would just include further information um, to allow a user of the statements to understand kind of what a contaminated site liability is, how was the number calculated, like it just kind of helps walk through um, and understand the issue. But it was, uh, it kind of had the sole focus on the financial statement disclosure and not, I guess, a broader um, outside communications or anything like that. Okay, thank you. Um, Carla? One more question. Um, I have a lot of questions and I recognize the timing is limited and so I, I guess my last question would be, and without putting you on the spot, and don't feel like you have to answer this question, but were there any questions that you were really hoping to get? Is there any information that is burning a hole in your soul for some reason and you're not sure why? Good question. <laughs> in March of 2023, maybe it would have been a mm -hmm. bit more timely because um, the report now is a little bit older and um, the work that Luke did do on following up on some of our Chapter 9 recommendations. Um, I think we've seen that most things have been uh, implemented uh, that we recommended. So, you know, at the present time, it, it's really just following up with our, if you can follow up with our um, entities that we've audited to make sure they're implementing our recommendations, that's, that's really what um, I'd like to see you do. Um, we're only a month away almost from <coughs> issuing public accounts for 2023, so well, there, there'll probably be some more pressing stuff to talk about uh, with this committee in the, in the coming months. Uh, that, that led me to one more question that I had written down and I forgot. So you were talking about how implementing recommendations is getting better, um, and then I noticed on the slide that it said in 2021, 37.5% of recommendations have been implemented so far. So that to me doesn't sound positive, but I'm wondering is that typical of what you would see in your three year kind of checkup points? Because they technically still have a year to, to implement those recommendations, a year? Is that right? So that was the first year that we looked at the first year. Okay. So we don't have any benchmark to go by, but if you look at that chart that's in the annual report, you can go back to some pages. I don't know. Page 19. No. <coughs> oh, okay. So yeah. So page 19. So, for example, if you look at 2021, that's 37.5% completed after year one. And if, in comparison, if you look at 2015, where they had 33% completed, that would have been four years. Okay. I can see what you mean now. By, yeah. <laughs> by so I think that I would expect that that 37 and a half will be much higher. I'll be disappointed if it's not this year, so I, I expect it to, to to grow. If it's not, we haven't done our job that you asked us to do as a committee. Thank you. No comment on that one. <laughs> Sydney? It's a brand new committee. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good idea to go the year after. I think so. 37 sounds slow, and, yeah. Yeah, but we've, the old way you went into UP. You might only have 37, 40 percent after a couple of years. Right. Kind of so, uh, it's a good idea, and I'm glad that they are following up. And, and uh, uh, anyway, I, I interrupted the chair earlier, so uh, sorry. But the, the point of clarification I was making, it, but when you were saying it, was like, you know, is that that social uh, uh, department, social development, or social services uh, yeah. and housing money is that stopping us from doing something? Correct me if I'm wrong, but if I remember, it was just money that we hadn't really claimed. It's not holding us back from doing projects or anything. It's just money that we're owed that we just haven't had a financial person go and do what they're supposed to just to get it like it's not that's correct it's, and it's still it's not like there's a window that like if you don't do it this year we're going to lose it it was just it's just something they just hadn't done because we know it's owed to us it's going to come yeah. i'd rather than focus on the obvious big issues that we have in that department for the last number of years that they were doing so it was just that clarification sure. so sorry for interrupting yeah. but oh, it, my pleasure. No. it wasn't especially for the new members it wasn't something that's holding us back from doing the objectives of the department. It was just money that's owed to us that, yeah. you know, it's like you just didn't go and collect it yet. Kind of thing. So if that's, if I'm right, yep, if I remember right. the previous meetings, that's what was it. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. 
Well, that was, um, that was, uh, is, does any of our guests want to uh, have any final? Are we missing anything? I think that was already asked, but. The only, the only thing I wanted to bring up was, uh, and I've talked to Ryan about this, is the, um, we met in camera on the report that we issued in the summer. Mm -hmm. And I was just hoping the committee would talk about um, whether there'll be a public meeting to discuss those reports or not. So I can just leave that with the committee to, to discuss. Okay, perfect. Yeah, we can maybe talk about that later on for sure, absolutely. Um, yeah, no, that's that's great. So we have a lot to, to talk about. We want to thank our our guests again for coming in. Um, it's great, and um, we look forward to uh, discussing things. We have a we have a busy fall, which I think is 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 exciting, as, as exciting as public accounts can get. But um, I want to thank you again for coming in, and uh, we're glad you're in your new offices and doing great work. So thank you and your your staff for coming in. So we'll take a, a two minute, uh, two or three, four minute break here, um, and then we'll come back um, for the rest of our meeting.
Okay, so we're back. Um, so we'll move on to uh, number uh, four, which is the report on the CCPAC CCOLA joint conference September 10th through 12th. And um, uh, it's great. So we've got uh, Vice Chair. Uh, Tyler DeRoche here, who was went uh, to that conference along with uh, member Hal Perry, and um, just wanted to maybe see if uh, you wouldn't mind briefing the committee on, take as much time as you want, um, brief the committee on your experience and uh, anything that we can take back um, and, and put in practice, if you will. So just take take your time, and, uh, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. Uh, went out to the conference. It was a great conference, lots of learning. Uh, after hearing all the different jurisdictional updates, it was pretty neat to see how everyone came up to me after I gave our update of how our committee was formed and was done. It was neat. All the different provinces come up and they want to hear about our committee because our committee has got two members from government, two members from the opposition, two members from the third party, where a lot of the other jurisdictions, it's not like that. There would be four or five members from government on it, and they normally can push their weight and sway it. So they were interested in hearing that and how it was working. Uh, it was hammered home a lot through the conference about non-party bias and whatnot. And uh, I believe it's next week that we have David and Leslie coming in to do some training from CAAF and... Uh, you won't find anybody more passionate than David. He shows that at the conference. Like when he speaks, he's roaring, he's yelling, like he is so passionate and he hammers every third line of his speech is about uh, non-bias, non-bias. And it's something that they really, really drive in. Uh, they had uh, seminars on climate change and different things that were going on and it all led into, we had a paleontologist come during one of our lunch breaks and speak to us and uh, I believe that uh, Honorable Hal Perry and I can get a Christmas card together and reenact the Flintstones as the two of us were standing there holding a woolly mammoth leg and it was pretty <laughs> cute. But. Uh, <laughs> But it, it was it was it was neat and about like he talked about the climate change and how it's affecting the north, how it's affecting Yukon and their mm -hmm. permafrost, how they're showing so many more fossils and whatnot. And they went over a lot of things. But all in all, it was the conference they really hammered home non party bias and they hammered home accountability, which uh, with the accountability more or less fell on being non-biased, so you got to ask the questions no matter what party you're from on every different aspect. So it was uh, it was pretty pretty interesting for my first one. Uh, next year's in Quebec, and uh, they they already started planning some of it, and obviously, and it's going to be I guess yearly when they have them. It's always a similar outcome, and you get a lot of camaraderie and get to talk to all different jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for that. It seems very, a very successful conference, and we're glad you were there to represent PEI and both of you. And uh, Carla. Tyler just, remind, thank you for that. just reminded me of something we used to do, and I don't remember if... Remember on our, I think it was even on our agendas, the last one was on public accounts, where we had, where we, at the beginning of every meeting, we read a little thing to remind us to not be... To, to be non like to be nonpartisan and and I can't remember exactly what it said but are, is that something that we're not, we don't do anymore? Do you, do you remember? Take that? Do you remember? Well, uh, sure. Because I think you were on the committee with me. I was, but that yeah, it just, uh, just I think it was something that the committee decided on, so it was a committee decision to to do that last time. So which will be interesting when they come back in because it was adopted from when CAF came in to speak to us and do the training before, that's why we implemented it. So it's too bad that we're, you know, that we're not. But anyway. No, well, it's always open to the committee. So it's like, that's what we're saying, is if the committee would like to consider that, um, And I you. guess it's, it's too bad to me. There's been a lot of examples where, you know, there's been an election and then there's kind of that institutional knowledge lost, you know, like as a new committee, if there, if there hadn't have been any of us who had been on the committee before and didn't know that, it's a shame when we do something positive to change something and then we don't yeah. keep it going because how would we know? Anyway. Yeah, no, and I'll, I'll defer to Ryan too because I don't know if I, if I answered that properly, so let Ryan uh, 
uh, uh, speak to that too. Oh, sure. Uh, no, you, you basically had it. It's, it was the statement of purpose and values. Thank you. And you're right. It was the previous committee, after having some training from CAF, decided to create that statement and, and repeat it at the start of each meeting. But that would be a procedure that that committee adopted for that committee. So it doesn't carry over to this new committee and the new legislature. This committee is, is currently in charge of deciding its own practices and procedures. Sydney? I move that the chair agrees that the terms and values of the Yeah, that's uh, a motion's on the floor. Um, anybody want to speak to the motion? Uh, I'll take a vote. All those in favor, say aye. Just, oh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, do you oh, want to re recall what the statement of purpose and values was? Sure, if you, if you have it. Uh -huh. Or we can always create our own. Exactly. I'm comfortable with the previous. <laughs> uh, just give me a moment. Statement of purpose and values. Sorry. That's what I said. Should have said. Procedures. I do believe next week when David comes in, he touches on this a bit. Does he not? He, I, from the conference. That's I why we started doing this. Because I do believe he does touch on it. I, I, well, I think actually David is not going to be attending next week. Oh, it will be Leslie Burns and possibly another associate, a former public accounts committee member from another jurisdiction. But uh, I don't believe David Christopherson will be. Oh, sorry. Um, the statement of purpose and values is the Standing Committee on Public Accounts is dedicated to improving public administration in partnership with the Auditor General. The committee examines the administration of government policy, not the merits of it. The committee strives to achieve consensus in its decisions whenever possible. Members take a nonpartisan approach to the work of the committee. So again, that was what the previous committee adopted, <coughs> drafted and adopted essentially, but it's the this current committee could have something different or, or nothing. It's up to the committee. Put it, put it up for discussion. Um, how does that sound for the committee? Good. Good. Okay. So we'll, uh, looks like it's unanimous. Unanimous? Um, so we'll, uh, we'll put that at the top of the page and we'll have it read before every committee meeting. Thank you very much. Um, anything else? Perfect. So thank you very much for that, um, that report and, and um, great. So we'll move on to number five. Um, review of correspondence, uh, proposed topics for CAA CAAF training session on best practices. Um, so I might pass it over to Ryan. So that's going to be, we, we've already started to talk about that. Um, do we have a, a potential opportunity to select what we'd like to talk about? Yes. So uh, CAAF provided this document that's before you um, the maximizing the effectiveness of public accounts committees. And it's a draft of essentially an outline of the topics that they would propose to talk about next Tuesday. Um, and you can see the outline on the second page. However, they'd like the committee's feedback if the committee uh, would prefer additional things to be addressed or is not interested in some of the things they've outlined. Um, they'd, or if the committee is perfectly fine with what they propose here. That's essentially what they're looking for. And also, as I just mentioned, um, it will be Leslie Burns uh, from the CAF delivering the training, but she has two options of uh, CAF associates to come and participate as well. They are uh, Sean Murphy, who is local. Um, he is the former MP, as you probably know, and was the former chair of the Federal House of Commons Standing Committee of Public Accounts. And then the other option is uh, Greg Clark, who is uh, a former uh, MLA from Alberta. I believe at one time he was leader of the Alberta Party, and he was on the Public Accounts Committee in that province as well. He, if he would participate, he would be appearing by video. So the, they just need to know if the committee would like one of those two gentlemen to participate with Leslie, or both, or neither. It's up to the committee. And Leslie will be here? 
She will, in, in person. Or she's on video before, I guess. Or was she here? Uh, she, was, was she, here she was here in person, yeah. Prior to the pandemic. She said, I think she said she was here in 2019. I guess that's when I was here. She was here yeah. last. Yeah, Have you been on public transport? Right. That's what I was saying. So it's just a matter of uh, who the committee would like to see at this time and uh, what's on the what's on the work plan if they'd like to add anything to that. Cindy? Uh, Clerk, did uh, Leslie say she'd like to have someone with her to to do this? Uh, I think she would. I think she finds it valuable to have a former member talking about their experience. But And it is typical that when they do this type of orientation session, they do involve uh, an associate, as they call them, to do that. But I think she's also comfortable doing it without such a member, if that's committee's preference. I'm good with having two people in person, get Leslie and, and invite Sean. Yeah. Just keep it, rather than having to try and do both. I'm sure Greg will be great too, but if they, Sean's willing to come in at the same time, sure. it's easy. Great. Perfect. I like in person. Yeah. I like in person more than I would teleconference. Yeah. I think that, uh, in person is that much more valuable. Yeah. Perfect. And is everybody okay with the uh, with the sheet? Is that, I'm sure we'll have some flexibility. Yeah. Okay. So we'll we'll say that this looks this looks fine as a an agenda. And one of the one of the things that, that I'd like to do and uh, as the chair of this committee is, is just bring us together a little bit more with the auditor general and more of a kind of what happened at the conference where everybody's getting together and and. Um, we're, we're, we're kind of doing this all together. So that's that's what I'd like to see for the committee, but I don't really have any ideas at this time. So, yeah. I just might add one thing too. I think, sorry, Chair. Yeah. Um, the Auditor General will also at attend on Tuesday just to be present as a resource for the committee. Perfect, perfect, excellent. Okay, great. Um, on the review of correspondence, uh, the second one is question, on written response versus in-person meeting regarding UPI funding agreement. That would be to the Department of Workforce and Advanced Learning and Population. And uh, I had asked a question to the Auditor General just to get his sense of, of what he would like to see with that. So um, is this a question uh, that came to us from a letter form? Um, yeah. um, so uh, if it's just a, what, what the committee would like to see at this time uh, to that uh, department. Sydney? Chair. So I wasn't at the meeting in, in the summer, or the first meeting when the committee decided to write the department. So what prompted the question on a written response versus the in-person meeting? Was that a response back where they wanted to provide written? Is that just some clarification over that? Yeah. Sure, yeah. The committee in the summer asked them to appear about the lack of a UPEI funding agreement. And just this week, um, I had been corresponding them, with them a bit, but they asked the question. They thought they might be able to answer the committee's question just with a written um, submission, but they didn't know if that would be acceptable to the committee or if the committee want, still wanted them to come in and in in appear in person. And so yeah, it's up to the committee. The AG, so, that's probably because they had submitted it to the AG, now we've realized, so that's probably why they thought a written response would be... Could be. They could didn't be. Say could be appropriate yeah. from you know yeah. just wondering either way kind of thing. So. Yeah. Yeah. Because they have submitted the the documentation to the AG. So, just a matter of uh, um, written or in person. That's the. Let's try to get that question answered. I'm just. Uh, Carl. Um. So this is. I was going to ask about the scheduling first so that we could see what that time frame looked like because I would prefer that that um, the department come in and talk about that. So if, if our schedule permits it, is this, is that, oh, this is. To be determined. Yeah, it, we don't have a date for that as, as per yet. Uh, that's correct. Um, most of the Tuesdays, uh, the upcoming Tuesdays are uh, have meetings scheduled, but there is one that's October 3rd where there's no uh, meeting scheduled for this committee. Um, I don't know if the department is available on that day, but even if they aren't, then the committee could then look at 
a non Tuesday as well if if the committee wished to get to have them appear say before the sitting. Uh, is that? Uh, I'm usually fine with a written submission um, based on schedule and everything like that. And then if you don't get maybe the answer, if there is follow up questions, then at the in person. Me, like or ask for the in person meeting, but that's that's just my take on it. Great. Thank you, Zach. Carol. And perhaps I mean I know October third. Well, I guess it's not that close, but we could put out the invitation for October third, and if they're not available, then we could do the written and then take it from there. Sydney. So, uh, Actually, I'm not opposed to having them in, but I'm not sure what the advantage of having them in is if we don't have the information to ask them about. It's like what's. What's your goal about having them in if we don't actually have the agreement? To be able to Carla? Ask, sorry, Chip, but to be able to ask questions. On an agreement we haven't seen. Well, I think that there's a lot Carla? of other okay. Sorry, Chair. <laughs> I think that there's a lot of other questions that, that we can ask about this. I don't think that it's... See, I'm only going by Sydney? the letter. I did, sorry, Chair. Yeah. I'm only going by the letter. So there's, there's more than just the contract that you're interested in. Carla? Yeah. I'm just going by the letter Sydney? that the committee sent. Is this an auction? Hell. <laughs> <laughs> Sydney? So if we're going to invite them in, what, uh, you know, if we're going to vote on inviting them in, what are we going to talk about? You said there's a whole bunch of other things other than what we already asked them to come in on. So, so what's the new thing? What, uh, thank you, Chair. What, am I missing a letter? We have a letter. The committee's letter of invitation from July 14th. Just one minute. I do believe we talked about that. So during the committee's first Sydney? meeting, it agreed to seek the appearance of officials from the Department of Workforce, Advanced Learning and Population in regards to the lack of a funding agreement with the University of Prince Edward Island, as noted in the 2023 Annual Report of the Auditor General. Therefore, we ask you and or your officials from the department to meet with the committee, provide information on why an agreement is not in place, any, any efforts to remedy, remedy this, and respond to questions from the committee. Determination of the personnel to appear before the committee is up to you, but under Rule 91 of the Rules of the Legislative Assembly, ministers do not appear before the committee unless specifically approved by the committee. So there's other stuff too, but that's the, that's the, the ask. So I'm okay with inviting them in for something else, but we should, you know, if the original ask was on that agreement, if we're gonna ask them in for other topics, I would suggest that we talk about what you wanna bring them into other topics and then vote on that. Otherwise I would say, if we're only bringing them in to talk about the agreement, which we haven't seen yet, but now we understand from the AG that there is one, I'd prefer to see the agreement, like Zach had suggested, get them to respond written. And then if there's questions on that, which I'm sure there will be, then we could, at that point, discuss bringing them in to, to, to uh, talk about it. So I just want to be clear on what I'm questioning them on when they come. Thanks, Cindy. Carla? And this is certainly not a hill I'm dying on. I, like, I, I, I guess I don't see it. To me, I would have questions without seeing a funding agreement. But we can do written. That's fine with me. Well, so, Sydney, then Tyler. So, well, let's talk about, like, what, what other topics other than the... Well, what, like, Carla? To, to talk about what would you, like, what are the... The things attached to funding for a for a university for a college like there's I think that there's a lot I, off the top of my head I can't think of anything but there's like that's a that's a big discussion mm -hmm. you know maybe I'm wrong I'm, maybe I'm looking at this wrong I don't know I'll just let Tyler and he had his hand up uh, <clears throat> my only issue would it would be I imagine they would have a pretty big department to run and if we sent them out a letter asking them to come in to talk about the lack of funding agreement they would prepare for that and then we get them here and we want to talk about something else maybe they could maybe they can not answer but the ask was for them to come in front of us for lack of funding agreement Sydney and then Carol. like so all that would be in, so that you had mentioned Carol, all that would be in the, the written agreement right Chair, I already said we could do written this isn't a hill I'm dying on that's fine okay so we will 
I'm just going to take it to a vote. Um, all those in favor of a written response at this time um, from the Department of Workforce and Advanced Learning regarding the, the funding agreement, say aye. Aye. All those against say nay. So uh, we will we will send them a written uh, a written answer back saying that it's okay at this time to send us the information that you have potentially in a timely manner um, if that's possible I thought, uh, uh, just whatever's convenient for them. I, will I, I guess I was I shouldn't say that timely manner, but just just take that out and just say um, we're gonna. We're going to request a, a written response. Thank you, Tyler. I would add in your response and the written that we may call them in if there was other questions. If that's what was being discussed after the written. Okay. Did you get that right? Yep. Okay. Perfect. Uh, Zach. We, we can that. We're going to receive the response. We'll receive a response, and then when we receive the response, we can discuss their response as a, as a committee and decide what to do from there. Yeah. I think it's, yeah, it's for sure. Perfect. Did anybody else have anything on that, Carla? Just a, just a clarification question. So are we going to get to see, I missed what you just said, Zach. You, I think you answered my question, but are we going to get to see that funding agreement then at that, at that point? Uh, I don't know if Sydney can answer that. Because <laughs> I, I guess the, the whole point that. of this for me is to see that funding agreement so then we have something. You know, so if we're not going to get a, the funding agreement or be able to see it, what's even the point? So am I getting this correct that the member wants to put maybe something on the floor, a question on the floor, can we include the agreement coming to this committee? Is that correct? Sure, why not? Yeah. 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 That's what I want in the written response yeah. before we invite them in to meet rather than them passing out something and then we're all trying to look at it and then ask them questions on it at the time. Just give us the written response that includes the funding agreement and then if we need to invite them in, we will discuss that and, and do it. Perfect. Okay, great. Great. Good clarification. So everybody's okay with that, so we'll get the funding agreement uh, from them at this time with answering the, the letter, obviously. Ryan, are we missing anything in that or do you have any? Oh, just how? Is there a timeline? Would you like to, would the committee like to put a timeline associated with that? Well, since it's ready, I don't imagine it would take too long to send it. And what would the timeline be? Tomorrow. I like Ryan's chance to start the well, when is our next when is our next meeting? Can we say some time before October tenth? Okay, um, that's too probably too long. It can be um, circulated prior to yeah, yeah. Um, um, maybe I'll make a suggestion for the committee. Maybe a week from today. Yep. Okay. Okay. So a week from today, end of business day. Okay. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, is everybody okay? I, I don't know where to put review, review of correspondence to, but the, the AG did talk about some things in here uh, today. Uh, is there anything that we would need to follow up on or the committee at this time? I, I, I'm looking at them coming in as being <laughs> correspondence. Um, is there anything that the committee would like to, anything they pulled from what the Elder General and his team said? Want to follow up on? Okay. And I'll probably ask that if the AG is in. I'll try, I don't know where to ask it, but I will probably try to ask that just to make sure that the committee is okay. okay. Um, perfect. So review of scheduling. Um, can we pass that over to Ryan? Um, so we can go sure. through the scheduling. And yeah, so the next meeting is uh, October Tuesday, October 10th where we'll have the Department of Finance coming in to talk about provincial surplus and deficit amounts and also the Department of Health and Wellness coming in to talk about health care recruitment funding. Then uh, after that, on 
Tuesday, October 17th, we have the Department of Housing, Land and Communities talking about uh, uh, various financial matters of the PEI Housing Corporation. And the last currently scheduled meeting is on October 24th, also Tuesday, uh, where Health PEI will address uh, budgetary matters. Okay. That's what we have at the moment. Perfect. And as well as the trainings coming up. Yeah. I skipped that. Tuesday. Tuesday. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> next, next Tuesday is yeah. our actual next meeting. So make sure everybody's got that in their calendar. Um, and everybody's okay with, with that, the scheduling? Great. And uh, is there any new business for the committee at this time by its members? Okay, can I, oh, Ryan? There was the, the Auditor General's question about whether the committee wants a public briefing on the COVID-19 phase two and performance reporting phase two reports that he briefed the committee in camera on earlier in the summer. So that's a question to the committee because um, I don't know if, if, if anybody that wasn't here, we did it in camera, so we did get the information on it, but but the public didn't really see it, wasn't able to. On the day, the report came out, but, but we haven't had an in, in briefing for uh, for the public. The report came out actually before we had our meeting. Not today, I think. <laughs> Comment. Seconds. Committee be would would the committee like to do to get the auditor in to talk about that report in here or is everybody okay? I'm okay. 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 Perfect. Yeah. Okay. So um, we will not schedule a meeting for that. Okay. Perfect. Um, that was Ryan's new business. But does the committee have any other new business? And is Ryan needed to, 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 before we adjourn? Is there anything else that? I, I think I've got everything. Good job. What a great, great clerk right here. That's a lot to, uh, to, for his position. So uh, thanks very much. No new business. Can I get a motion to adjourn? Carlo Bernard, thank you very much. We'll see you on Tuesday, committee members. Thank you.